Welcome to Insights into Success, where with your host Paul Dodds, we hope to educate, inspire and motivate you to achieve your own personal success. We talk to guests from all around the world, from a variety of walks of life to hear the realities of their own journey to success. What challenges have they faced, how they cope with failure and what have been the keys or will be the keys to their own success. In our Read to Succeed interviews, we talk books that have inspired our guests, and for some, they share their secrets to marketing success. Join us as we give you insights into success. All right, so Jeremy, welcome to Insights into Success. Really excited to have you on board today. You've got an interesting story to tell us, and just for people listening out there, just to summarize, you're a CEO of Command Your Brand, you're a podcast host. You're a former powerlifting champion, which I'm particularly interested in. And you've been, to, yeah, look at it, the guns. <laughs> and Oxford University graduate as well. So welcome. Uh, really yeah. excited to have you here. And I'm just wondering if you could start off by sort of describing to me what your personality is like, you know, because I kind of want to understand a little bit more about, you know, who you are and what makes you tick. Um, gosh, what is my personality like? I am... Uh... I guess the easy way to put it is stupidly persistent. Um, like I will like, you know, keep going until that wall breaks. Um, another yeah. thing is I'm a, a bit of a wise ass just a little bit. Um, I, I always love a good joke. I uh, love a good comedy movie. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm somebody that really enjoys time with my family. Um, I have I've been married since 2015. I have two great daughters. And, uh, you know, yeah. that's I guess how I would describe my personality. Wow. Cool. And so for you, what I would like to understand is what you were like in your early years and included in that, you know, as a preteen, you know, sort of what were your interests around that time? Hmm. Like for me, um, I've always been like, I guess, naturally an introvert. Like I had to learn to be an extrovert. So I've always been somebody that was naturally an introvert. So um, in my teenage years, um, I was building a lot of things. Like my dad was an engineer. So I was always yeah. like building things, whether it was like with erector sets or with Legos or whatever it may be. Like I built a four foot long uh, scale model of the Titanic. That was that was kind of fun. Wow. Um, and, and it did sink when I put it in my, my swimming pool. Um, so <laughs> I, I was always doing things like that. I was always um, interested in learning. I would watch these History Channel specials about, you know, um, Greeks and Romans and, and things like that. And I, I was I was reading a lot as well. Um, I was I started reading Tom Clancy books at like 11, like The Hunt for Red October was one of the first books that I don't know if you should give to an 11 year old, but I definitely read that. So I've <laughs> I've always been somebody that's been interested. I've always considered myself uh, like a seeker in a lot of ways. Um, and I was pretty introverted, man. Like I didn't hang out with a ton of people. Um, I was decently athletic, but I wasn't super athletic until after yeah. school. Um, but, you know, that that's I was, I guess, pretty nerdy in a lot of ways. So it's interesting you say about being introverted because, I mean, the first thing when you come on is like, you know, you've got a great personality and really positive in that. So the last thing I, I would think is, like, oh, gosh, this guy's quite naturally introverted. I get it. Well, but it's well, interesting. I, I, I like I'm somebody that I like a long project and preferably like with the door closed and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I don't know. I feel like you can like people, but at the same time, be very into like routines and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so just off recording before you were saying about your upbringing, that you were brought up in the New Jersey area. Can you mm -hmm. kind of give us a little bit more of a, a picture of what that looked like? So it's very like rural around here. Um, I think when people think of New Jersey, they think of like cities. They think of, oh, it's close to New York. And for, for me, that was never really my reality. I didn't go to New York City other than to go to a Yankee game, like maybe once a year. Like that wasn't really a lot of what I did. Where, where, I, where I'm from, there's more cows than people and there's a lot of farms and things like that. I remember as a, as a teenager, my dad was really good friends with the local farmer and I actually would spend the weekends like planting green beans and weeding and things like that. So my picture of New Jersey and what a lot of people think New Jersey is, is, is two very different things. It's very rural, uh, you know, farming type experience. And if you don't have a car, you're not getting anywhere because there is no like mass transit or anything out here. Right. And so tell me, like living in the country, did that 
encourage you any way to you know develop your imagination and sort of entertain yourself more do you think or were you still sort of into i don't know online gaming and that sort of stuff i mean did it have any bearing do you think on your on your you know development i don't know about like online gaming because literally like we had dial-up internet until i was a sophomore in high school so like the online gaming wasn't really a thing like you were like yeah. forced to to really entertain yourself so it was a lot of going outside it was a lot of um like i played baseball for hours and hours and hours with you know the kids on my street and stuff like that so it was a lot of stuff like that it was a lot of like yeah. you know like sandlot baseball games and stuff like that it was a lot of fun we used to play uh we used to play baseball with aluminum bat and a tennis ball now that was fun man you could hit a ball a long way doing that <laughs> long way, um, yeah. oh my gosh yeah but like that's what a lot of mine was it was like neighborhood kids and, and stuff like that it wasn't really like online gaming wasn't really a thing you know because I'm in, I'm in my, yeah. my mid-30s now so i'm kind of in that cutoff yeah. where that really wasn't around when i was younger yeah but so for you though do you think that being in the country do you think that that kind of did encourage you to develop your your creative side your, your imagination more you had to kind of entertain yourself more as opposed to being in a city maybe where there's a lot more things going on around you i would definitely think so because you know i had to create a lot of my own fun um you know we it's i remember we lived where we lived there was a lot of woods behind our house and yeah. uh my my buddies and i growing up we used to like you know dress up in full military fatigues and we do all this like wild stuff out in the woods and stuff like that you can't do that in a city right like number one no. you may get arrested because they'd be a little concerned you're in fatigues uh but number <laughs> two like you know you really have to be forced to have your imagination we built a lot of stuff um you know we built uh like we built uh i remember building these like soapbox derby cars but we covered them like sheet metal so they looked like actual cars like we did a lot of stuff like that and wow i just don't think you have the ability to do that kind of stuff in the in the you know, in, in a city and, and and things like that. So for me, it really made me work my imagination a lot more. Yeah, and I mean, the reason I'm sort of talking about it is because I do believe firmly that it's important that people develop their creative side. And mm -hmm. if you are in a sort of a built up environment, I just kind of wonder whether for some people that will inhibit their ability to develop that side. Whereas I, I lived in the country too, and you had to make your own entertainment. So you really had to be creative and and use your imagination and stuff, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, that and also like I think I learned the the value of hard work as well, because yeah. you you learn about like you know my my dad had a huge garden every year, so you know we'd spend you know three or four weekends at the beginning of the summer getting it ready for for all the tomatoes and stuff like that, and you know rototilling and making sure it was weeded every few weeks and. You know, I was expected to cut the lawn every week and, you know, I hated the trimming part because, you know, doing trimming just stinks because it takes forever and the weed whacker would always break. So I just for me, it was a lot of also learning the value of hard work. And I I, I don't think those things because they're not available to you in the city, you don't get that same type of appreciation. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. I definitely know what you mean. So as a young teenager, you know, what would you describe were your interests and kind of at that point, where were you thinking you were going to go with your career when you grew up? At that point in time, I thought I was going to be a college professor. That was really what I thought I was going to going to do with my life. And if I had to describe myself then, like I really wasn't into to weightlifting or anything like that. That wasn't until after high school. Yeah. And um, I was a, a wrestler. So I, I was wrestling was really the big thing that I did. It was, it was, you know, that, and, you know, thinking I was going to be a teacher, um, that, that was really what I thought I was going to do with my life. I started out there, um, but it ended up being very, very different than where I ended up. And so tell me, I'm really interested to hear about how you said you're into wrestling and then you moved on to powerlifting. Tell mm -hmm. me how about that part of your journey, how did that come about and what level of success have you achieved in that area? So interestingly enough, like the, the, the powerlifting stuff came out really because, so I was a, a wrestler in the 140 pound class. Um, so that's a, you know, it's a relatively small cl class and it's a pretty, it's a pretty stacked one, right? Because a lot of guys are around 140 pounds when you're in high school. So it's, you have to compete right. against a lot of people. So at the same time, in order to stay that weight, I developed a lot of really unhealthy habits, frankly. And, you know, it was, um, you know, overeating, you know, and then throwing up or, you know, under eating or, you know, running around in garbage bags makes you're sweating it out. So like, frankly, mm -hmm. my, my health experience wasn't very good in order to stay quote unquote healthy in order to wrestle. So for yeah. me, you know, the whole weightlifting thing really just started as taking better care of myself. And I'm right. somebody that really enjoys competition. So when I saw that I could, you know, 
continue to, to up the numbers and get better and get better and get better that there, that motivating thing activated, right. Where I wanted to get better every single week. Cause I, for myself, the biggest way I got strong was something I call linear progression. If you can get five pounds stronger every week, that's how I went from barely being able to bench a bar to benching 455. Yeah. So for me, it was taking care of myself better. And then it became fun and it became something like I really just got addicted to it. It was a great experience and a, and a, and a lot of fun. And um, in competition, um, they do what's called the big three. The big three are bench press, squat, and deadlift. And right. um, in, in my, my career best doing that is I benched 455 for a single. Um, I squatted uh, 705, and I, I uh, deadlifted 635. Um, I wow. also did some, like, some, some weird ones, too. Like I uh, pulled an army tank for the Wounded Warrior Project. That's about 80,000 pounds. <laughs> so they, wow. put it on the, they put it on the back of an 18-wheeler. They put it in neutral. And then you got to pull it 12 feet, um, which I managed to do as well. But, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of fun doing that stuff, man. It, I think some of it reminded me of the competition of wrestling. And, you know, I really got there because I was trying to take better care of myself. And, and in terms of those numbers, the, the big numbers, where did that place you, though? Did you, like, you obviously entered some competitions. And at what level did you get to in competitions? So I did a lot of, like, like natural type stuff, which... Um, a lot of the bigger competitions aren't tested as much. So it was more like regional things like that. It wasn't like, you know, right. it wasn't like a national champion or anything like that, but I was one of the stronger people in my weight class. Um, yeah. cause I was only five foot seven and, you know, 180 pounds, 190 pounds. So like my, you know, weight to what I was lifting ratio was pretty darn good. So I was one of yeah. the top competitors in my class regionally. And what, if anything, do you think, you know, that has impacted on the rest of your life. Is, is there elements to what was required to be good at powerlifting that have kind of influenced you in the rest of your life? I'd say it's really two things. It's consistency is the really big thing yeah. because a lot of people want to see these huge jumps and gains and things like that. And I think when you first start lifting, you're going to see a lot of those early on, right? You're going to see some early gains because your body's never done it before. And then yeah. the gains are very slow and consistent and you have to be showing up year, you know, day after day, year after year. So one part of it's consistency. The other part's mindset, man. Like I, you, when you've done things like that enough, you can, you can look at them and be like, Oh, I can lift that. That's not a problem. Or, you know, I can give that a shot. That's not a problem. And I've taken that mindset into a lot of other things that I've done. Um, it, it's very, very interesting. I find the more people I talk to that are, you know, like high level, you know, competitors, business people, for them, one of their core competencies is their fitness. And when when you have a really great fitness routine, it gets you mentally in the right state to do a lot of things you're doing. So for me, that's always, it's a thing I still do to this day. You know, yeah. not at the level I did, you know, I, was, I got up to two, two, 215 pounds at my most and now I'm like 165 just because I want to fit normal human being clothes. Um, yeah. But really that consistency and the mindset are the two biggest things. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting you, you talk about that because I, you know, I mean, I, for me, I'm going to the gym is really important. And I think mm -hmm. for me, it's it's both a physical and a mental thing. Um, I think mentally it's really good because it you can go there to the gym and turn off all the noise and just focus on doing that. So it gives you time out. Like you might be having a really challenging time, mm -hmm. but you can go to the gym and just put that to the side and just focus on what you're doing. And I find that really therapeutic. The other thing for me is much like you is I, I believe that going to the gym and that it teaches you discipline, it teaches you consistency, uh, helps to build your determination. I think all good qualities that are going to help you in, in other aspects of your life. So for me, I think doing what you've done is is an integral part of potentially your success in other elements of your life. I think as well, it's also where you have it in your day that matters too. Like for me, having it early in the day you yeah. get a win to start the day off, right? Like, and that's a pretty easy win to just go to the gym and have a great workout. Like that's a pretty easy win compared to a lot of the stuff you deal with all day. So I think yeah. as well, if you can start your day out with a win, um, you have a lot more successful day because, you know, you didn't start out with a failure or something like that. So when, what time would you go to the gym in the morning then? So it, it's usually like 7.30. It's not like it's crazy right. early because, you know, for the type of workouts I'm doing, my body won't function the way I need it to earlier than that. Like I've tried to, man, but then you get like a headache that won't go away all day. So, uh, <laughs> so, and we, we don't want that. So no. for me, it's like my body doesn't really function uh, to do the type of lifting I'm doing before, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. 
Um, I'll, yeah. I'll go through emails and things like that, you know, earlier than that, but I won't do any physical work before that time. Right. And then just what's the, what's the rest of your day like? How long do you normally work each day? How many hours do you put in? Every day is a little bit different, but I'd, I'd have to say a lot of times um, my my mid afternoons are, are pretty like low. And that's when I can do stuff with the family, do whatever it may be. And then sometimes I end up doing um, interviews and stuff at night, depending on what people's schedule are, is. But I do for my own podcast, most of that's done during the day. And most of my my calls and meetings and stuff are during the day. But I, I tend to find that between two and five in the afternoon, I usually don't have as much going on. And that's when we can fit in some family stuff uh, with girls and things. And so do you feel that you've got enough time in the day? And, and to add on to that question, um, what's your secret to it? Feeling like you can get through enough in the day. It, it's interesting because I feel like um, one of the biggest things I've done at, at my company is every time I feel like I'm overworked, it means I'm wearing too many hats. So I write up one of the ones I'm wearing and hire somebody else to do it. And I'm starting to get to one of those spots again where, you know, we have a book launch coming in June. Um, you know, the podcast is growing, the company's growing. And I'm, I'm, you know, basically right now, I'd say I'm at the the max of what I can do again. And it's time to hire again. It's, it's interesting, because I do like to put a lot of those positions there myself. So so right now, I am starting to feel like I guess on the edge of what I can handle. And it's time to hire again, man. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to come back to your podcast. I want to talk yeah. about that. Before that, I want to hear a little bit more about your study. And if you could tell us a little bit about what you study university and, and how you ended up going to Oxford University. So I, I did my uh, undergrad degree um, in uh, Catholic theology and uh, and uh, wow. religious studies. I was a double major. I did I did uh, one side was ca was Catholic studies and the other side was uh, was Judaism. Um, I just very, wow. I've always been very interested in, in religion and what makes us who we are and, and where we come from and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then I actually ended up doing um, a program at, at a, a New College Oxford, and I ended up going to a few different you know universities within that system because Oxford isn't one school; it's a bunch of different schools. Yeah. And uh, that was for um, for a literature program. So I studied a lot of work of, of Chesterton, a lot of work of Lewis um, and, and things like that. And I actually got a chance um, to go hang out at uh, C.S. Lewis's estate. I became really good friends with uh, with Walter Hooper, who was the gentleman that runs uh, C.S. Lewis's estate. So that was pretty cool to get. It. And, wow. and, and, you know, we were still exchanging letters and stuff up till a few years ago. Um, so it, that that was a pretty cool experience. And so. After that, I actually came back and to, to the U.S. and I did my my master's in ancient history. Um, I studied early Roman Empire propaganda, so I took a look at how the Roman emperor convinced people he was God. There were specific tools he used used and a, and a plan he followed. Uh, basically, the the life of Alexander the Great on, on how to do it the right way. Well, that'll be interesting and interesting to <laughs> then compare it to the context of today and yeah. the propaganda out there today. And Dude, it's wild. I, I feel like I don't know what, what news is real and what news is fake anymore. <laughs> I know. It's crazy, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Oh, interesting stuff. So at that point in time, you were planning on becoming an academic, carrying on and maybe getting yeah. a position at a university? Yeah. And it's interesting because I feel like, and I, I don't know if this is how a lot of us grow up, but I feel like I, I grabbed the dreams of my parents as well. My my mom and dad were both high school graduates that, you know, were really my dad was a really great athlete. He, he wanted to play professional baseball, but, you know, didn't really get super far in that before he ended up actually having to get a, a factory job. And yeah. uh, my, my mom intended to go to school to be an architect and she'd actually gotten a, a full scholarship. But then her, her dad passed away her senior year and she had to raise her brother. So for them, wow. like. I think I picked up one of their goals, which was just to, to go to college and to, to, you know, teach in that area. And yeah. it wasn't until I kind of explored more of what I wanted to do that I found out that wasn't really a fit for me. But I didn't really take a strong swing at it. And I think if something really was your dream, you would take a really strong swing at it, right? You like you would yeah. refuse to give up. You would do whatever you had to do to make it work. So basically, I got done with my master's degree. I applied to uh, NYU, which was the one school I applied to for my PhD. I didn't get into that program. And that was it. Like, I didn't try to go any further with it. So I, I think, was that really my dream? I would have pursued it. I would have done whatever I needed to do. I would yeah. have called people. I would have connected. And I, I just didn't. And it was from there, I actually ended up teaching high school uh, for a couple of years after that. And it was just, for oh, me, wow. I was not happy doing it. Right. So what changed then? So you, you taught at high school for a little while. And what yeah. happened next? So 
I came out of school in 2011 and uh, what was not a great economy, which is funny to say because I think the dollars lost like 25% of its value in what it was in 2011. Um, but there weren't a lot of people hiring at that point in time. So I actually ended up painting houses during the day. And I worked with a house painter that like did everything old school. So everything's by hand. You used a scraper. Yeah. You We were doing these old like Victorian type homes that like, you know, they took four different colors and things like that. And then at night, I was the nighttime manager at a gym. So I was working like 16, 17 hours a day. Wow. And um, I happened to run into a, a priest friend of the family that said, hey, the, the, the private school I used to teach at is looking for teachers. You don't need any yeah. formal background or training. You know, you just apply for the job and hope you get it. So I ended up doing that. And I had no classroom management skills. I didn't have an education yeah. background. I was purely an academic. So they like they had me for lunch, man, like literally because, yeah. you know, you see me now I'm in my mid 30s. Like you can imagine how young I looked at 24. So yeah. I, I looked like I was a junior in high school. So it just it did not really go well from that perspective. And I really wasn't ready for the whole smartphone thing yet either. So like their whole day was trying to get me angry and then get me on YouTube. And that was <laughs> that was my day. And then and so so I just wasn't very happy going to work every day. And then when I yeah. was 25. Uh, my mom ended up having a really bad stroke and it made me look at everything I'm doing and be like, well, is this really my dream? Is this really what I yeah. want to do? And I didn't know what my own dream was, but I was willing to go out and find it. And 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 that really was where it went from there. Yeah. So tell me about that. So from what I understand, you kind of really, you know, tried a lot of different things mm -hmm. before you kind of found your niche. So I kind of like to understand a little bit more about that process and how that came yeah. about. And also, too, I know, and I want to hear a bit about this, that you had some surgery. We actually had a near-death experience. So yeah. I kind of want to understand where that fitted it into the equation or whether or not that had any sort of fundamental impact on where you've ended up coming to now. It's interesting because I feel like when people tell you about a near-death experience, they tell you about like how their life changed and knew their purpose and how like, you know, the skies opened yeah. up and things like that. And it just, that wasn't really the case for me. It was, it was a really right. weird experience though. Like, I, um, it, I, I had uh, knee surgery on my, on my left knee, but the anesthesia didn't go well. And I don't quite know what happened, but they couldn't get my blood oxygen level up. So for like almost four days, I was in and out of consciousness so often that it just kind of felt like one, one like long event, which is really hard to describe. And, you know, you're aware and you're, you're, you're there and you're aware, but you're not interacting or engaging with people or anything like that. Yeah. And it just like you can feel emotions, you can hear voices, you can see things. And it's just it's just it's really odd, man. And I just remember my parents being really upset because I remember the doctor saying, like, I don't know. We don't know what's happening. We don't know why it's happening, um, but we can't get his oxygen level up where we you know, think he's going to be OK. And they yeah. actually brought in a priest and, and, and gave me last rites at that point in time. And that my body started breathing on its own and we can't really explain what happened. But the, the crazy part about it is like, it didn't change my life. It was right. just this experience that I feel like it should have changed my life. Right. It should have yeah. made this big difference. It should have made yeah. me look and it didn't. And the, the thing that actually did it for me was when I almost lost my mom. And I think, I don't know, it's, I think it's because it was something outside of myself, you know, and, and you look at it and it's, it's more real to you because it's not you. And you look at it and you're yeah. like, wow, yeah, th this could end. This could change. So that really made me look for something more. Um, I, I it didn't happen after this, after, you know, having this near death experience myself, which in itself was a wild experience. But it, it just it didn't change for me. Um, it did show me, um, you know, a lot about who friends were, because I was kind of shocked that people that I thought were my really good friends didn't even come and visit me. Um, oh, and they hadn't, oh. heard from me in, hadn't heard from me in three days. So it taught yeah. me a lot about like um, a lot about people. But at the same time, it didn't teach me, you know, the lesson I thought I should learn from, which I did learn from almost losing a parent. Yeah, it's interesting. I kind of I get with what you're saying, though, that like when it's yourself, uh, the the event probably was kind of a bit surreal and hard to yeah. really take it in. But when you're seeing someone you care about it happening to them, that's very confronting. It's very much in your face. So. Yeah, it, I get it was like watching a movie. Like I almost couldn't process mm. it. Do you know what I mean? Like because you're just yeah. like you feel like you're there, you're observing, and you're you're watching it. It's really hard to explain. Yeah. So okay, so you've been doing some painting and stuff, and and that. Where did you go from there? So I, I taught school for for two years, and then uh, my mom had a stroke in in 2012, and my, it didn't really like take an effect until 2013. Do you know what I mean? Because you kind of get like 
shocked. You get woken up a little bit and you're like, all right, well, what does it mean? Where do I go from here? What happens? And in 2013, my, my wife, who at that point in time was my fiance, was presented with a, with a network marketing opportunity. I didn't know what that was. So like, she's like, oh, you got to watch this thing. So I watched this presentation. I'm like, we're going to be millionaires like next week. This is going to be awesome. Um, so I'm just like, I just got to just gotta go find me two people, man. And it's over. Um, needless <laughs> to say that didn't happen, but it was one of the best training experiences I've ever had in like, you know, running a business because when you have yeah. no experience, you really have to learn it through the school of hard knocks. And I think that really is yeah. the, the, it's the school of hard knocks. It's really what it is. And I did that for a couple of years. I then went to selling life insurance, which I was really darn good at. And I, I, you know, I made a hundred phone calls a day and I, you know, I went on house calls and stuff like that. But to me, the experience of talking about death all the time was just really difficult on me, like mentally and emotionally. It just doesn't yep. put you in a good space. And it really takes a special type of person to do that. And I, I wasn't that special type of person. You know what I mean? Like for me, it just, it wasn't right. And I ended up doing that for, I think, about six or eight months, and I made some really darn good money, and I made more than those six or eight months than I had made in the previous year and a half, wow. um, but I just was not happy doing it, and I actually then saw this webinar that you could like buy products from China and sell them on Amazon. I'm like, oh, cool, man. Yeah. I'm in, and I made the mistake of putting on my product listing on Amazon the promo code to get my product for a dollar. And somebody realized that and bought me out of everything I had in stock. And I was out of business in my first six hours. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that was a lesson. That was a big lesson, man. It was a big lesson. You should proofread things. Um, yeah. so, that, so that was kind of the end of my like entrepreneurial career. And I, I didn't really know what to do at that point in time. So I actually reached out to a friend and I had taught myself through all these experiences. I had learned how to build websites. And yeah. I ended up doing building websites for my friend's marketing firm. And I had been a podcast listener since like 2007. I've, I've still listened to that same podcast today, actually. I think they're on like 1,500 episodes, the No Agenda Show uh, with Adam Curry and John Dvorak. And uh, I've, so I've been a listener for a really long time. And I've always loved podcasts. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe I can give it a shot. And yeah. I launched my first show in 2014. It was called Rock Your Life. It was horrible. It was bad. Um, there was no miking. There was no strategy. There was, you know, no content that was valuable to people. And I quit that in about 90 days. And it wasn't until 2015, um, after spending a few months abroad in Peru, um, I did this thing with uh, with Rotary International. Where I did an exchange and like learned about businesses in Peru, and I did some speaking all over the country and things like that. And it made me kind of put some perspective on what I've been doing. And I said, okay, so where is this going from here? And you know, I decided I'm going to try this again. I'm going to do it the right way. And I launched Create Your Own Life, and we had 10,000 listens in our first 30 days. And you know, we had a, wow. a, a lot of great things that happened from there. And talk me through that. What like what was different? What's different with your second podcast? Like, so you did the first one and, and it, mm -hmm. it didn't work. So what have you done different that's really worked this time around? Well, the the first thing was a viewpoint of professionalism. Like that is a really big thing. Like realizing if you're going to do something, do it well. And the right. first podcast I did, it didn't have any value. It didn't have like it wasn't easy to listen to. It just wasn't easy to listen to. And it was very like life coachy, which I'm the furthest thing from, you know, I'm somebody, if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to, to grind it out, if you're willing to push it out, there's a lot to be learned from that, but it just didn't feel like me. You know what I mean? It just wasn't real to me. And at the same yeah. time, it was all driven by content I had to create. The second time around, I took a course on how to do it better. You know, I got a, a decent microphone. I, you know, put a good strategy together. And I also reached out to the hundred people I most admired. And I had a good amount right. of those people saying, Hey, yes, I will jump in on this. And it got out there. We created some good content. But the bigger part was, what was I willing to do to get it out there? And in that right. first 30 days, I uh, sent out 3,000 individual LinkedIn messages by hand because I didn't know there was such a thing called automation. And uh, <laughs> I asked all these people to subscribe to my show because I knew that was the number one thing that ranks a podcast is subscribers in a 24-hour period. So I did yeah. that. I also... Um, I also reached out to a small email list I built individually. I had about 700 people on that, and I got all those people to subscribe if they could. I texted every single person in my phone, and I was trying to get them to subscribe. I was even at the point where I was grabbing people's phones in public and saying, hey, let me show you how to subscribe to my podcast. I was willing to do whatever I had to do to get it in front of people. And we hit iTunes new and noteworthy, um, which got us eight weeks of free promotion, and that really helped us to, to grow the show on solid footing. Right. And so you've been going how long now? 
We're uh, closing in on year seven. Uh, we launched November wow. 20th of 2015. And how often do you publish? It's changed over the years. We started with seven days a week, which is way too much. Went yeah. down to five days a week. And uh, then really the, the bulk of the calendar for, for four of those years was three days a week. Then right. July of last year, I realized that like number one, the content world of podcasts has changed, meaning you have to produce better long form content. Like it's really important. And number two, I was starting to get burnt out. So I had to keep myself interested. So I went yeah. down to two episodes a week where we chat for an hour, hour and a half at a clip. So we can have some really, really great, valuable content for our listeners. And yeah. um, I found that really for me now, that seems to be the winning formula of where we're at in the podcast world right now. And so in terms of length, what's your view on that? Do you, do you think a podcast should be just however long it needs to be, so long as the content's yeah. great? Or should it be kind of like kept to like 30-minute episodes and you split them up or something like that? What's your take on that? My thought process has changed over the years. I used to think mm. it was 30 minutes because that's what people had time for. And what I started finding, and I don't know if you found this as well, it got really, the better I got at it and the more I did, the harder it was to fit it into 30 minutes because yeah. there was more yeah. things to discuss. There was more thing, you know, more places to go and, and more threads to follow. So to me, it takes as long as it takes. You know, I've done an hour and 15 minutes. I've done 25 minutes. It's, it's whatever it takes to feel like, um, you know, I've really accomplished my goal in that episode. And a lot of times it's to teach a subject, to dive deeply into subject or to, or to learn on something. And it's I, I find you know not really putting a time frame on it's the best way to do it. Now I'm not doing three hours because my brain can't do it that long. I'd need like two <laughs> cups of coffee, but you know, yeah. like for me, it takes what it takes to get there. And what about though, like you, so you've got one that's say like an hour twenty and it's great content. Would you contemplate splitting it into two and publishing them separately? And sort of the one, I guess, is then the teaser for the second one. Not re not really because I'm somebody that I like to have like a full conversation with someone here. Um, yeah. and, and that's just kind of been, I don't know if it's the creator in me that looks at it that way, but I look at it as this is how it's created. You know, we're going to edit it and we're going to like, you know, definitely make sure it's the best version of what we can make. But to me, I feel like you need the full context of what was said. Um, so yeah. I just, I'm not big on splitting things up into a part one and part two. Now that we've done, one of the things we've started doing recently is doing like topic, a topical series, like, oh, these three episodes, we're going to cover this. And these are the people we're going to yeah. talk to for those series. Now that's been cool. Um, but I try to keep the conversation to a single episode and how are you finding it these days because it's obviously it's become increasingly popular to do a podcast so for you has that had any bearing on you or do you think you've sort of you're ahead of the game anyway so you kind of had your momentum so the fact there's a lot of people coming in and, and kind of doing similar things it's not really being an issue for you well, I think the thing you got to look at is there's like there's 3.5 million podcasts out there, which is wild because when I started, there was like 240,000. And wow. um, isn't that huge? That's a, that's a big growth. That's amazing. But the thing that is really interesting, um, Edison Research does this, this study every year called the Infinite Dial, which kind of lets you know what's going on in the podcast world. And the, the last one they had out there said that only about 18% of podcasts are actually active, which means they produce some sort of content at least every two weeks. Right. So to me... You run in your own lane, you create good content. Yeah. And frankly, there's not a lot of people that are consistent anyway. So it's, it's, I don't really see as, you know, having to be ahead of the game or, or change what it is, as long as you're trying to create quality content and getting it out there. And for you, how important is that you enjoy it? To what extent is, it's, does that rank? It's vital because I have to want to do it. You know what I mean? And I find that yeah. for a conversation to be really good, I have to be interested in the topic. I have to know enough about the topic. I have yeah. to be, um, you know, able to think with the topic it, at this. I, I think interviewing is one of the most vital things to actually be interested in what you're doing, because if you don't have interest, like you're not going to want to discuss it. You're not going to have great follow up questions. You're not going to want to continue the conversation. And what about chemistry with the person you're interviewing? You know, like because sometimes you, you, you interview someone and you really like them. And you, so the conversation's easy. And then there's other people you're like. I don't really like this person, but I've got to do this interview. How, how's that for you? And what are you doing? And or do you have that experience? I don't do those interviews um, because because right. here's one of the things that I do. Like I find that like I'm not a crazy preparation person, but I find like how I prepare is really important. And one yeah. of the things I do is uh, number one, I'm a lot of people I'm reaching out to now. They're people I've consumed their content a lot, so like I'm familiar right. with them. I'm interested in them. I want to talk to them. There's a certain reason why I want to talk to them, so that's one part of it. But I also listen to other interviews they've done with people I admire. 
And the reason I do that is less about the content and more about how they communicate. Because you want to learn, do they answer questions long? Do they answer questions short? Are they somebody that needs a really good setup? Are they better with a follow-up question? Um, if you ask them an open-ended question, are you going to have enough time to finish the conversation? Because there's been, <laughs> I remember my first interview, I did. I interviewed this guy who was a, he was a, con a casino magnet out in Las Vegas. And I asked him one question. I'm like, hey, man, what's your story? Worst question you can ever ask because there's no, there's no end to that question. So I hit record. I asked that question. And 48 minutes later, I said something again. So you wow. really want to make sure you understand like how they communicate because that's going to be vital to how you control the conversation. And you can handle a lot if you have an idea about what that's going to be like going into it. Right. And I don't know from your point of view, but from my point of view, it's, it's easier said than done to interview people. You know, like, to be honest, until I started doing it, I didn't really think too much about it. But when you get in there, it's like, okay, I really respect people that do it and do it well, because it's not as easy as what you might think, or at least what yeah. I thought anyway. No, I, th I think that's true. And, and um, you know, I, th I think around 200 episodes, I started feeling like I was good at it. You know, we got to like 700 episodes. I'm like, all right, I'm almost there. And I feel like around like eight something, I really started feeling like I could kind of, you know, really handle the conversation. So it's just a number of times you're willing to do an interview, frankly. It's to me, yeah. the better I got at it. Yeah. And I guess over time, you've just, you know, through talking to all these people, you you would have expanded your knowledge base so much more. And yes. You would have a lot more confidence in talking to people on, on a lot of different topics now because of that experience. Well, and I think as well, the thing that's really aided me is I'm one of those weird people that I always win Jeopardy in my own home. Um, I have so much <laughs> random knowledge that's not useful in any way, unless if you yeah. want to talk to people for hours at a time. So <laughs> I've got a lot of basic knowledge about a lot of things that I can kind of, you know, I can kind of punch above my fighting weight with a lot of people. And I, I think that's been something that's been extremely helpful. It's just something about me personality wise that has been very helpful. And so, okay, so you, you got into podcasting. How has your business evolved from there? So, you you know, obviously you, you're generating an income now. So, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about what exactly your business does and how that evolved to that point. Because obviously when people start off podcasting, there's no money in it. They've got to get to a point where they can sort of generate an income off it. Mm -hmm. How did that happen for you? So one part of it was the podcast itself. We started to monetize. One of the biggest ways we've done that is through affiliate offers. Um, I found products I like um, and we promote them on the show and we, we get a cut of that. And those work pretty well for us. My yeah. favorite is, uh, is Audible. And uh, Audible, they basically give you 15 bucks to give away a free month of their service. So I wow. tend to tell my audience what book I'm reading. We give away a lot of free books and I make a lot of money off free books. It's great. Um, uh, so that's one thing that we've done that the, the show has been profitable since like really our first month for, through that. Um, but the other thing was I had people start asking me for help, like, Hey, can you help me start a podcast? So yeah. what we actually started doing was we called it slate media productions and we did this full service, you know, podcast creation service. And I had no idea how to hire anybody. I had no idea how to do proposal. I had no idea how to do any of these things. So I remember sitting down my first person, I'm like, so it's going to be 20,000 a month. And he's like, great, I'll give you a 1500. And I'm like, I'm in. And uh, <laughs> I didn't make any money, man. It wasn't profitable, but we did a darn yeah. good job building some shows for people. And what we found was we were working with people that were really busy CEOs. We were working with people that were, you know, really busy running their companies and they liked having their own podcast. But frankly, they just wanted to go on other podcasts. And one of the things we did when we launched the show was help book people on other podcasts. So we dropped the 80% that, that didn't really matter um, because they didn't, they didn't want it, right? And we just yeah. focused on the 20% that they did want. And that was really, you know, what branding are you trying to do? What positioning are you trying to get? Um, you know, who are you trying to reach and how are you trying to reach them? And then we focused on the right shows around that along with, you know, storytelling training. And, and that's really been vital. And the, the company's grown well throughout the years. We're up to a team of uh, 15 and, and we're really, you know, continuing to try and do the best job possible. And so for you, like, so now you're saying that like people that are into podcasting, they potentially can engage your services and you're going to help them primarily get onto other people's podcasts, mm -hmm. but in doing so having a, an appreciation of what they're trying to achieve, what their brand is, where they're trying to go with it. And then yeah. you'll look to try and marry them up with the right um, podcast to, to get them you know, to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the thing you have to look at is like, not every show is going to be the right fit for you and not every show is yeah. going to want to talk to you, going to want to talk to you. And that's, and that's true as well. So you've got to figure out like, what am I trying to achieve? 
whose vibe do I match? You know, what's the positioning I'm trying to achieve? You know, what am I for or against? What am I best at doing? And when you can really look at that, you can number one, offer the right value to the right people, which is vital. And then number two, like the program you're doing is going to have an impact, not just for you, but also the shows that you're on as well. Um, because you can make a really incredible impact with even the networking you have. And throughout this whole process, have you ever been concerned or felt, you know, the sense of, of um, imposter syndrome? Has that ever been something that's been a factor for you or you've not really ever had that issue or thought about every, it? Every day in my life, man. <laughs> every day in my life. I, I think it's it's the doubt will creep in. It definitely will. And, and you have to remember, you know, why you're doing what you're doing what you're trying to achieve, where you're trying to go yeah. from here, because the doubt's going to creep in. You're going to have a bad client. You're going to have a podcast that doesn't do as well as it thought it did. You're going to have a product that you create that you think is great and everybody's going to want and nobody's going to buy it. So, right. so you're going to have those things every day, but you got to remind yourself why you're doing this, who you're doing this for, and you know what your impact is. I, I go through that every single day, man. There's, there's, there's right. different days I doubt myself on different things. And how do you get through that? What keeps you going then when you, you've got those doubts coming into your mind? How do you deal with that? Well, the biggest thing I look at first, um, and this is maybe just weird about me, is I look at all the things around me that like all the projects I'm working on, I look at the ones that are undone. And I say, what is the easiest couple things that I can accomplish today that are undone? And when I group those things together, you get those wins, you automatically start to feel better and you get more bandwidth because you freed yourself up with those projects. So that's the first thing I tend to look at. Um, the other thing I the other thing I really like to do is I like to look at like successful projects we've done for clients before, successful podcasts I've done for clients before for, for interviews before. And yeah. when you do that, you see what you've done and what you can produce and that you are competent in what you do. And and those to me, that's maybe I'm weird, but those are the things that have worked for me. Yeah. And for you, you know, for people coming into podcasting now. What would be some key pieces of advice you'd give them about what they need to focus on if they want to, to be successful? I'd say, first of all, be willing to be in this for a minimum of six months to a year. Most people are just not willing to stick it out long enough to see success. So I would say that's the first yeah. thing is be willing to be in this for six months to a year. The second thing I would say is be willing to put the audience in front of yourself. Because I think far too often people are like, well, what is this going to do for me? And it's like, okay, well, what are you going to do for them? Because right. the only reason you have a platform is because of the people you offer value to. So I try to always remember that. And I think the, if you can do those two things, you know, be willing to be in this for the long run and put the people that are consuming your content first, you're going to get a lot out of this, man. And it may take longer, it may take shorter. Yeah, absolutely. And for you, what, what do you think have been, you know, the keys to your success with this so far? What, what do you think have been the special ingredients that have led you to, to get to where you are now? I think part of it is the consistency, you know, and I think that's gone back to, to everything I've done, right? Like is I've I really in my fitness background, I've always been consistent. I've mm -hmm. always managed to get a little bit better every day. And I think that's part of it. The other thing I would say is I'm naturally an inquisitive person and I yeah. always want to learn about something. And I think when you can approach it like that and you always want to learn, then you're in good shape. When you don't want to learn, number one, take a look at the subject you're looking at. You may not want to learn about it. Number two, um, you know, take a look at what's going on in your life that may be causing you to not want to do that. You know, there may be things holding you back. Um, so, so to me, I think those are the two things that have really helped me are consistency and, and really being inquisitive and interested. So one, one kind of issue that I have, and I don't know if you have this issue and, and maybe you'll be able to give me some, um, of your perspective and, and maybe some advice on how to deal with it, but I kind of, I'm like you, I'm, I, I like learning mm -hmm. life. Is, it's a lifelong journey of learning. The issue I have is kind of knowing um, where to, to choose your focus and where not to, because you can end up going in so many different directions. And even like with online these days, it's great. There's so much content, but it can be your downfall too. Like what I do, for instance, every day I have different articles come in from all over the internet, you know, and it's for me, it's all about keeping on top of, you know, general trends and, and being, having a good awareness of what's going on. But but it can lead you down a rabbit hole and, you know, oh you gosh, can end yeah. up going all these different directions. And I'm like, Oh, maybe I should learn about that. But then there's, you know, so how do you deal with that? Cause I find that quite hard, you know, and I'm worried that, you know, you, you're trying to learn too much in too many different directions, but then you're worried that you're going to miss learning on something that really you should be learning on. What's well, I think, on that? I think the thing is always finding the uniting characteristic you can bring it back to. 
and as a host, if you can figure out how to bring it back to um, one uniting characteristic, it's important. You know, we've started in the last couple of years covering more like news items and covering big stories and big topics like that. Um, yeah. You could say at face value that doesn't fit as much with create your own life, right? Like that seems more personal development and a lot of it is. But here's the thing. If you want to create your own life, you need to know what your barriers are. You need to know what the game yeah. board looks like. You need to know different things to be able to operate as the world changes. So if you can figure out a uniting characteristic and continue to bring it back to that in your interviews, you're, you're golden, man. But that's what it comes down yeah. to. You've got to figure out the thing that unites all those things you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, so for me, for my podcast, you know, it's insights into success. So for me, it's, it doesn't have to be monetary. Success can mean different things to different people. And I'm wanting to kind of understand and expose what have been the keys to people in succeeding in whatever it is. It could be in music, it could be in business, it could be in sport, whatever. And there's a commonality between the successes that people achieve in, in, in the different environments that they choose. So yeah, I mean, so for me, it can it can potentially be very broad, but mm -hmm. it all comes back to what have been the components that have allowed them or enabled them to achieve whatever was important to them. So, yeah, so I, I take your point. I think the same with you is you can kind of go broad, but as long as it all comes back to that, that core theme, that core thing that, that you are um, focusing on. And I think it's vital. And I think that's where a lot of people miss it. Like they don't have that core theme. And if you do, you know, like, and it sounds like, you know, you want to know what makes somebody the best something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that could be, you know, the best musician, that could be the best chess player, it could be the best business owner, whatever it is. And in order to, to put that together, man, there's, there's a lot of different background you can have on that, but it really brings you back to being the best. Yeah, absolutely. So for you, what does define success? What's, what is success in your mind for you? That's tough because I think a lot of people think success is a place you arrive at, right? They think it's a destination. Like, all right, I've reached success. It's like, yeah. great, congratulations. Um, I, I think when you, when, you, <laughs> when, you, when you look at it, success is, you know, being happy with what you've achieved. Yeah. But at the same time, being happy with how you're achieving it if that makes sense like you know like yeah, yes. like i'm i'm happy that i'm able to help a lot of people i'm happy that i'm able to make an impact with my sh with my show and you know with my books and with things like that but at the same time i'm happy that my family is able to be a part of it and because of what i do i'm able to spend time with them so i think yes. success really is an ambiguous thing but i think it's a couple of viewpoints man it's being happy with what you're achieving and, and happy with how you're achieving it yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the latter is important. And I think there's a lot of people that can achieve supposed success, but they actually feel very hollow because of yeah. the way in which they achieved it. So that I think can be a critical factor. Because I think people tie it too much to money, right? Like, because yeah, money's Absolutely. great, but you look at how many of these, like, you know, how many women is, has uh, uh, Elon Musk been through in the last two years, you know, or, or Jeff Bezos' yeah. marriage fell apart or all this different stuff. And it's like, yeah. okay, you have money, but if you don't have all these other things, then, you know, at, at a certain point, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. And and that reflects, I guess, you know, pot well, potentially, I can't speak for him, but different interpretations of success for you. Exactly. Obviously, the family environment is really important. It's not all about money. There's a lot more components that go into it. But so with your mother and her having a stroke, has that had any bearing on what you view as success now? Like has the health component been brought more into your definition of success because of that? Being married and having children, has that influenced how you see success these days as well? I think absolutely, because you know what I mean? Like you need to be able to be there and be present and, and be well in order to do that. So for me, I think it, the tough part about it is health has always been a big component of my life. And I think I've always taken it a little bit more seriously than my parents. Um, yeah. In some ways, you know, I've kind of been that that voice in their ear like, hey, dad, you got to worry about your blood pressure and stuff like that. But, you know, I think it definitely has made it more important. But I think it's always been pretty important for me. Right. Yeah. I mean, from my point of view, like my father died at age 60. So he did, died pretty young. And he had always left he always said that he was going to do all these things when he retired and he mm -hmm. never got to retirement yeah so for me it's definitely had quite a significant bearing on my life in so far as a not taking your health for granted and trying to look after yourself and b also not putting everything off for some time in the future and that's a challenge too is because obviously you know 
if you go out and do everything, you might not have any money or you might run out of money. But by mm. the same token, if you're saving up and everything's, I'll do that in the future when I retire. But look at my dad. He never made it, you know. Well, my, my dad just turned 67 uh, last month. And um, we finally got him to retire last November, which I was really excited about. And he'd always <laughs> kind of just been working because working is what you do. Like he didn't really have a purpose to do anymore. He wasn't really enjoying it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, we helped him with, you know, fixing up his house and selling his house and, you know, helping him and my mom buy a new house and doing all this stuff. And we yeah. got him moved on to their next era in life. And man, he golfs three times a week now and he loves it. So it's at right. the same time, like, I think that is something, you know, like, you can offer your parents as well. You know, if, if you can help them figure it out, which, you know, we help them figure it out, you know, there's, there's a lot of life to enjoy yet. If you can, you know, do that. Yeah. yeah I think for people, when they do come to retirement, in my opinion, one of the keys is they need to have interests. If they've got nothing going on in their life, nothing to focus on, then they can effectively, it seems like lose the, the will to live. But if yeah. you've got yeah. things to do, I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. He just won the, uh, he just won the, the, the national championship last year for his age in golf. So he's, he's still doing, wow. doing pretty, pretty darn well for, for the, it's like the club level uh, team. So like he's yeah. still enjoying himself and he's got a lot of good golf and retirement ahead of him. Yeah, no, that's great. And so for you, what's, what does the future look like for you? What, what goals have you got coming up? What things are you wanting to, to achieve? Well, for me, like we have the book coming out in June, uh, Unremarkable to Extraordinary, which I'm just really excited about. It's been three years in the works and it was always something I always tell myself I'm not ready for. So for me, you know, getting that out and making a big impact with that. And, you know, I, I really have a goal of, of hitting a bestseller list with that one. I really want to help a lot of people with that. So that's part of it. Um, you know, this year as well, um, we have a big goal of doubling our revenue from last year, uh, which means we can hire more people, which means we can, yeah. you know, offer more services and things like that. Um, and at the same time, I'm just, just on a personal note, I'm just excited to start traveling with my family again, man. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 part of, part of, you know, what I do is I do a lot of speaking. Like I've, I've spoken all over Europe, all over South America, North America. And the cool thing about that was always bringing my family with me and having great experiences. We had this awesome family trip where we, we saw like five European cities in 2019. We haven't been able to do any of that. So frankly, just like, yeah. Traveling with my family again for work is just going to be a lot of fun. And so when you do these speaking engagements, what sort of um, what sort of audiences are you talking to and what are you talking about? What sort of topics? So there's there's different types of audiences I speak to, like in, in, in uh, I mentioned that one in 2019 that was in, in Kiev and I spoke oh, to a no lot. Way. It was really? actually I, 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 wow. I, we, have, we have a lot of love for Ukrainians in my family and yeah. um, I spoke to a bunch of digital nomads, like people that can work on a computer from anywhere. That was a really cool experience. But I'll also like, I, I go and speak at events to C-suite executives where I talk about how to build a, how to build an extraordinary team and, and things like that, or, you know, how to compete in um, and, and sell in the, in this modern social environment. So it, it really depends. And there's a lot of different audiences I speak to. I, I also um, have spoken all over South America to, to different rotary clubs. So there's there's been a lot I've been able to do and I've been been very lucky to be able to do it, man. And then how have you ended up getting those speaking engagements? Is that you're consciously going out through PR or that to promote yourself to get them or has it been word of mouth? How have they come about? So there, there's two different ways. One is I just get a lot of referrals of people saying, hey, you know, this organization or this person is looking for somebody to speak and they usually reach out to me and we, we chat about it. The other way is... Um, it's called a call for speakers when companies are looking for a speaker. So I have a Google alert set up for the word call for speakers in quotation marks. Yeah. And then every time an organization puts out a Google alert looking for speakers, it's in my inbox. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and that's worked quite well for you. Oh, it's worked very well. Wow. And coming back to what you said at the beginning, you know, you yeah. talked about being introverted. Tell us a bit more about that and how you've evolved, because obviously an introvert doesn't want to get up and speak in front of people, doesn't want to, to do or doesn't feel comfortable doing podcasts. Tell us about that, your evolution to be able to do what you're doing now in that regard. Which is funny because I love it now. If you'd done this to me like 15 years ago, I'd have been like, no. <laughs> um, but like, I think part of it is you just, Number one is the purpose of why you're doing it. You know, I, I want to wow. help a lot of people. And if I help a lot of people and they help people, that's a that's a really big deal. Yeah. But the other part about it is like the more often you do it, the easier it gets. 
you yeah. know, like the, the first time you're on stage, I was shaking, man. Um, but now I've yeah. been on stage so many times I'm used to it and I have fun with it and I'm engaging with people. And I've also love, you know, learned to love communication and you can, yeah. you know, as much as you can communicate is as much as you're alive. Right. So I feel right. like the, the, the more we're able to communicate, the more we're living. So to me, it's been a lot of experience, a, a lot of connection and, um, you know, just continuing to do it. And I guess from what you've said before and that, it's like you 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 respond to challenges. Your philosophy is based on incremental improvement. So presumably when you started out with podcasts, it would have been scary. Yeah. And it's not really kind of you feel like that's really your thing. But you pushed yourself. You did it once, twice, and so on. And then just incrementally, you know, you've got more confidence and got better at it. Is that, is, am I right? Is that kind of how it sort of happened for you? Yeah, well, it's, you look at any professional athlete, man. At some some part and point in time, you know, they were an amateur. And it's yeah. that day after day after day after day. And it's, you know, that's that's why, you know, I've wanted to tell the story about being, you know, unremarkable to being extraordinary. Because I feel like we are all unremarkable in, in some way, yes. shape, or form when we start out. Um, but it's the things we do day after day after day that lead us to becoming extraordinary. And yeah. and that's what I think is is it's really all about. It's that gradual improvement day after day. And it's not what people want to hear, you know, uh, because, no, the diet industry tells us, oh, you can lose 15 pounds next week, which isn't true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, you know, like this internet marketing uh, company tells you, just buy this product and you're going to be a millionaire in six months. Yeah. It's yeah. not true. There's people yeah. that do ha get lucky once in a while. They do strike it yeah. rich the first time, but most of it, it's consistency. It's day yeah. after day and it's showing up, man. And that's how you get to be extraordinary. Yeah. I, I've always said, you know, I think, you know, catering to human weakness, if you want to make quick money, then you either come up with some sort of new ebb machine or something like that and tell them that they're going to have these amazing ebbs in, you know, a couple of months or whatever, only five minutes a day, I might add. Yeah. Or alternatively, some quick rich scheme, because inherently most people are lazy and they don't yes. want to put in the hard yards. They want to hear the story that they can get rich overnight or they can have an amazing body only five minutes a day for three months. You know, so there's so many people out there that are gullible to that. So all mm -hmm. you need to do, and I'm not I'm not suggesting people do it, but that's how so many businesses have got successful because they appeal to the human weakness. Yeah, people don't want to hear. Oh, yeah, I had to work ten hard years grinding out, you know, long hours each day um, to become this incredibly successful person. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear that it happened overnight. <laughs> That's exactly it. And and it's it's well, there's there's two different things I'll say in this. You ever see Robin Williams live on Broadway? Yeah. Okay, it is one of my favorite comedy albums, and he talks yeah. about um, those like belts people would strap around their waist that like. You know, they shocks them and they and they get in, getting uh, good abs. He goes, if you believe that, you should strap it to your head and it might be a little bit more successful. So that's one part of it. <laughs> I like that. That's a good point. <laughs> the, 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 other, the other part, back to back to what you said on a, on a more serious note, is is I think when, when, when I'm talking to people about doing a good interview or doing good content, I tell people, tell people everything you know about the subject. Everything. Because so many people don't. Because if they're like, if I do, somebody's going to go out and do it. They yeah. won't. They're lazy. Right. But they right. will trust you and understand that you can get it done and you will grow your business that way. But I think so many people are, because so many people are lazy, there's so many there's so much opportunity out there for people that are willing to work hard. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting what you're saying there about, you know, you and you read about in different respects, but this concept of giving out a lot of value and in doing so the worry is that if I give up too much value, no one will want to come and buy off me. But the, the counterpoint is, is one that, you no, know, if you give out a lot of value, people will trust you. And even if you've only held back, you know, 5% or whatever, they'll still come to you and they'll pay for that because mm -hmm. you've built up that trust and respect with them. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, like for that one person out there that listens to everything you have to say and does it and is successful with it, they're going to tell other people about you. And that's cool too, man. Like that, like, yeah. like think about that. Somebody yeah. like I, I salute people that are willing to work hard from something they taught themselves how to do. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. Well, just to wrap this up, what's your thoughts on, you know, people being successful? You know, do you think anyone can be successful or do you think it comes down to luck, genetics, 
uh, economic background or other variables. What's your take on what it, what is required to be successful? I feel like success is when luck meets preparation, right? Because you're going to have these things that happen every once in a while that are kind of lucky, right? Like those things happen. Yeah. But if you're not consistently showing up every day, you're not going to get lucky. So I think yeah. it's a combination of two things. Like success is when preparation meets good luck. And you'll yeah. find the more you're preparing, the more you're showing up, you tend to get a little bit luckier. So yeah. I, I think I think it is both parts is luck and, and definitely hard work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is, um, as you're really touching on there, is the fact that if you stay at home, you're not going to be doing much. And if you're not doing much, not a lot is likely to happen to you. Yeah. Whereas if you're out there trying things, yeah, some things might go awry. But ultimately, if you're out there pushing the envelope, trying to do a lot of things, meeting a lot of people, there's a bit of odds that something good might happen to you. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Like it's, it's, you got to risk it for the biscuit, you know? So it's, if you're going want, willing to go out there and do it and show up day after day, man, that's where success comes from. Now, one thing I, I meant to ask you before, and I don't want to miss out on doing that. Can you just tell me a little bit more about what the book's going to be about? So it's about a lot of what we've been talking about today. It's about the stories I've learned about people that consistently showed up, um, the yeah. people that, you know, took control of their own self-education and, you know, it's about, you know, developing real courage in yourself. Even if you don't feel like you have courage, you can start somewhere, you can create it and yeah. you can start on remarkable, become extraordinary. And that, and that's, I, I think anybody can do it if they apply the principles that I've, I've learned from most a thousand interviews. So who's your target audience? Who, who are you hoping is going to read this book? I'm hoping to reach people that have that feeling inside that they were meant for something more, you know, right. and they've, they've been told by others that they weren't. And they know right. that they can do it and they know that there's something out there for them. And they're, they know that, you know, those people that are telling them hard work isn't worth it are lying to them. So that's who I want to that's who I want to, uh, to reach is those people that know they were meant for something more. They're willing yeah. to work hard to get it and they're willing to show up day after day. Yeah. Very cool. Sounds really interesting. And how long to you think it'll be published? So it's actually our publication date is June 7th. Uh, we are uh, in pre-orders right now, so people can grab that anywhere out there over at getextraordinarybook.com. And uh, yeah, we're just really excited for it. Awesome. Well, it sounds really interesting. I've really enjoyed talking to you today. And yeah, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from it. Particularly what I like to do is actually I like to be involved in the editing because I get to watch the interview again and I can get more out of it that way. But that's purely selfish. But um, yeah, it's, it's a good way to because at the time it, the, the conversations can go so quickly. And, you know, sometimes it's good to go back and then rewatch it and go, oh, yeah, that's right. They made that point or what have you. So uh, but look, thank you, Jeremy. It's been really awesome to have you all the way from New Jersey talking to us here in New Zealand. Super cool. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, looking forward to talking to you in our ne next very short po podcast, which is Read to Succeed. So uh, watch out for that. But in the meantime, thank you very much, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Paul. This is a lot of fun, man. Uh, awesome. Thank you.